Welcome to Triangle BNI. Today's show is brought to you by Simply Done Concierge. Folks, we can make more money, but we cannot make more time. So if you need time back in your day, some errands run, uh, pet sitting needed, meal prep, laundry, go to Simply Done Concierge. Let us know how we can help you. We'll give you some time back so you can be in two places at one time. Hi, everybody. My name is Mike Manning. Each week on Triangle BNI, we bring you a local small business success story. If you are not familiar with BNI, it is Business Networking International, the world's largest networking organization. Our little slice of heaven here in the Triangle, Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill and the surrounding cities. Each week, 32 chapters, about 540 members get together. Our goal is to help each other grow our businesses. And our local small business success story today is Samantha Moschella with Everfit. She is a women's health and fitness coach. Samantha is also a member of, uh, uh, geez, you think I'd remember that, uh, Connections in Motion. They meet Thursdays at noon at the Hibernian Pub on Falls of Noose. Samantha, good after or good morning. How are you today? Hey, Mike, how are you? Doing well. Glad you're here today because... Uh, around the calendar, not around the clock, around the calendar, we should be concerned with fitness, but we are February 6th, I think today. And there's a lot of us have already broken (laughs) new year's resolutions. Uh, so what do we do with the second month started and maybe we haven't done exactly what we want to do in January. How do we get that momentum back? Well, it's never too late to start again. Like every day is a new opportunity to get started, you know, working towards your goals or your dreams or whatever that might be, whether it's health and fitness related or something else altogether. There are many misconceptions in many industries. Uh, And the fitness industry has one. I think a lot of times people think, well, I don't want to join a gym. I don't have time to do this. I don't have time to do that. And there's a lot of regular day to day stuff we can do just to start, because I get up every morning and go walk in the neighborhood. And there's other things around the house that are simple things we can do on our own to get started, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Your biggest calorie burn is not gonna come from your organized workouts. It's gonna come from the movement that you're doing throughout the day, every day, from getting up, to making your bed, to vacuuming, to walking the dog, to going to and from work, whatever your daily routines are, that's going to be your biggest calorie burn is just your normal movement throughout the day. The exercise component is just meant to give you a boost in that and to help you build strength and endurance and all of that stuff as well. So just get moving. That's kind of the easiest and simplest place to start. And then once you're ready, you can add in the more organized workouts. So if we made ourselves vacuum every other day, that would help, wouldn't it? It would burn more calories and you'd have to, you know, clean carpets, right? (laughs) Now, Zoom has sent a lot of people home to work, which means we're sitting in our chairs. Uh, How do we make ourselves get out? What can we do to get out of that rut of sitting down in a chair literally for five or six hours at a time? Um, Yeah, absolutely. So I was a teacher when COVID started. So we were sent home and worked virtually and um something that was great about it it was march so the weather was great so whenever i got a break in my routine i could get up and take the dogs for a 15 minute walk or you know just stretch my legs or walk into the next room go get a drink of water or something like that so if you're sitting at a desk most of the day find breaks plan breaks in your day and um take advantage of those get outside get some fresh air get some sunshine get some steps in and uh, make the most of it so the key is just to move, right? Absolutely. Yes. Hmm. How simple is that, right? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so put the remote at the other side of the room. So at least you have to get up to get the remote to come back to change it and take it back, right? There you go. Yes. <laughs> All right. One of the things I like about B&I members is when they niche down to a group of people that will be their ideal clients. And all over your uh promotional opportunities, social media, and everything. The quote is, I help women boost their metabolisms, burn fat, and build a body they love. That's now, there are a number of things in this world that are not fair and that are double standards. And it is hugely wrong for women 
to be looked at different, like, oh, wow. And we see older, balding, fatter guys on TV that have, you know, the looks. And if a woman looked like that, there's no way she'd be hired, which is just, but that's a whole nother podcast. But I love the way you want to help women. So why, why do they call you to work out with you or work with you? Um, you know, I can relate to what they're going through. I've been through the struggles. I grew up, you know, during the society of diet culture. Thankfully, we're starting to see a lot of changes in body image right now. Um, but, you know, when I was growing up, if you didn't look like a Victoria's Secret model, then, you know, there was something wrong, right? Or we were taught to get our value from the number on the scale. And uh, thankfully, like I said, we're seeing changes in that right now, but there's still a lot of that that's ingrained in us. And, you know, I've been through the struggles of typical women on the diet roller coaster where you want to look, you know, sexy in that little black dress, or you're trying to lose the weight after having a baby, or you have a big event coming up, or just, you know, the stress of life women are naturally givers and we tend to put ourselves on the back burner, which, you know, over time, you know, maybe the weight tends to creep up or you kind of lose sight of, you know, how you want to look and how you want to feel and how you want to perform. So I love to, you know, I guess I've been through the journey myself and um, I know what works. I know what doesn't. And I love to help women, you know, reach their health and fitness goals in a way that is healthy and sustainable and doesn't promote diet culture, doesn't promote negative body image. You know, I want them to love themselves and, you know, be able to do all the things that they love to do because they are healthy and fit and confident and all of those wonderful things. And we'll get to the confidence thing in a minute. Uh, when you were on your journey of losing weight, you know, getting more, I don't know if more fits the right phrase, but you know what I mean, in better shape, you're feeling better. When did you know you were on the right track and what you were doing was working and you started feeling better? Um, yeah, it's kind of funny. Um, so I, to get a little personal, I went through a divorce. So that was kind of a time where I knew that I was re like finding myself in this new chapter of life. And I knew that I needed to get myself back on track as far as my, you know, fitness goes. I was, um, I played sports growing up. I'm an Air Force veteran, so I was always super active and outdoorsy and adventurous, and I had lost track of that. And um, so I really stopped focusing on what the scale said and started focusing on how I felt, like eating and, you know, being active in such a way that made me feel good, made me feel strong, made me feel confident, gave me energy to do all those things I love. You know, that, that's really what worked for me, um, but I didn't really notice it until I was actually um, taking my kids to the pool and my ex-husband pulled up in the driveway to drop some stuff off for the kids and I was walking out in my bathing suit and he goes, whoa, when did you get a six pack? <laughs> and I looked down and I was like, really? <laughs> I, I, I guess I wasn't really tracking that. Um, because that wasn't my goal anymore. My goal was to feel good. Um, but when you do things that naturally promote health and wellness, you know, helping you feel healthy and fit and strong and confident, all those things, the, the weight takes care of itself. It's, it's kind of a side effect. It happens. Um, so yeah, so I guess that was kind of the, the aha moment. I was like, whoa, when did I get a six pack? I guess it just happened over the course of, you know, <laughs> me exercising and hiking and, you know, traveling and doing the things I love. Um, it just, it happened. <laughs> and it was all that a combination of you started sleeping better. You were less winded when you went hiking, the pants fit a little bit better. I mean, is it, does all of that go into it? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the total package. It's, it's learning to take care of yourself. First of all, listening to what your body needs and then giving it what it needs. You know, um, I've had women approach me saying, you know, I don't understand. I'm eating healthy and I'm working out, but I can't lose the weight. And I go, well, how much are you sleeping at night? And they're like, oh, I'm only getting four or five hours of sleep at night. Like we really need to take care of ourselves. And for me as a mom, for the longest time, I felt guilty doing that because it was time I wasn't spending with my kids or doing something for them. Um, but what I learned was that if I took the time to take care of myself, they were going to get a better version of me. 
So it may be a little less time because I was at the gym for 30 minutes or doing a hike for an hour or whatever the case may be. But the version of me that they're getting, I'm more present, I'm more engaged, I'm, I'm in a better mood, I have more patience, I'm just a better mom to them in the time they're getting with me because I'm taking that time to take care of myself. And I'm also setting a good example for them so that, you know, down the road, you know, even nowadays, they, they are learning to invest in themselves. And it's just awesome to see that when they ask me questions and when they're curious and when they're wanting to do something that is just a good investment in their own well-being. It's a proud mama moment. And so let me say this. I've said this for years. I say it publicly, privately. The toughest people on the planet are moms uh, because, A, you generally marry my type and we don't make your life easy. But you've got kids, you've got jobs, you've got your body, you've got everybody else's needs. And just so moms, I want to say it as many times as I can, the toughest people on the planet are moms. So uh, on your, as I was doing my research over the weekend, uh, you post food options on Facebook and some of your social media stuff. And while I appreciate that, um, I'm going to draw the line with you, Samantha. There's no way you're going to talk me into a cauliflower pizza. (laughs) <laughs> Other people have mentioned it, so don't even try. There's no way that's any good, right? You know what? Have your pizza with the pepperonis and enjoy it. So the, the goal with healthy eating isn't to yeah. eat everything perfectly. Yeah. Perfect just doesn't happen. Um, but if you balance it, if you have a healthy, balanced diet, so like I put, I don't know how much research you were doing, but Saturday was National Eat Ice Cream for Breakfast Day. Yep, I saw that one. So we made ice cream waffles for breakfast that morning. Did I feel guilty about eating ice cream for breakfast? Absolutely not. Because I eat healthy most of the time. So then I can splurge that 10 or 20% of the time and, you know, eat the foods that I really enjoy. And, And that's really what it's about when you're super restrictive with your diet and you're not enjoying the foods that you eat, then it's going to be really hard to stick to it. And it feels like punishment. Like who wants to do that? Right? Yeah. And it's almost if you manage the rest of the day, you can have ice cream on your waffles. But if you do that three times a day, that's going to be a problem. And that's where I think a lot of people, you're right. They're like, oh, I can't have anything. No, you're not going to be happy. You can't have anything you like. Yeah. And then it snowballs. It's this all or nothing mindset that we have. So it's like, oh, I had the slice of pizza. Like I'm off my diet now. I might as well have the beer and have the cake too. You know what I mean? So if you learn, if you let go of that mindset and learn that, you know, all things in moderation, right. And just creating balance in your diet and in your, you know, your exercise, your fitness, then you'll be able to get the results you want. In the cauliflower pizza, I've got a couple of friends of mine to tell me instead of using the dough, they use cauliflower to make the dough for the pizza. I'm like, I'm, I'm not for that. So and they try to tell me it's good. It probably is healthier. I'm not arguing that point, but there's no way it's better. <laughs> there's all kinds of crazy things out there, and you just got to find what works for you. Yeah. Uh, in life in general, uh, I think most people give a lot of weight to people's opinions that they don't even like those people, or they're not a factor in their world. And as a guy, I have no idea what women go through. So I'm not even going to pretend like I maybe think I don't, but I just think people listen to too many people about, Oh, you look this, or you do that. It's like, we, we need to shut out a lot of that stuff. And especially on social media, if you don't know the people, Lord, don't listen to them. Well, yeah. And social media is tough in general because for the most part, everyone posts all the good stuff, right? They're perfect, yeah. And then you yeah. start comparing yourself to the other person and you're, it's like somebody, one of my friends put it some way, I don't remember, like you're comparing your behind the scenes to their in front of the camera. Ooh, and it's ugh. just, it's apples to oranges, right? Yeah. Like, so, um, so yeah, so we need to give ourselves grace and give others grace and, you know, judgment, just comparison doesn't work, you know? Um, when it's you, not helpful yeah. for anyone, for yourself or for no, the other person. It um, is not. Whether it's pers- it's weight loss, business, and you know how you're raising your kids, you know, don't, no, just stop. So uh, when you were going through your journey, your transformation, were there a couple people that you listened to 
that gave you advice on that, or did you just read the results of your body and how you were feeling? Um, you know, thankfully I had a really fantastic group of girlfriends that we would hike together. And when you're out in the woods for, you know, three or four hours hiking, you have nothing to do but talk, right? <laughs> um, so we talked about everything, um, including, you know, everything from, you know, emotions and stress, which is a huge part of it, to, you know, activity and nutrition and all that stuff. So it's really good to have a support system when you're going through any kind of transformation, whether that be something physical, mental, emotional, professional, whatever that case is, having a support system um, is super important. So yeah, definitely. Um, you know, it's not like I was counting macros or anything like that, although some people do that and have great success, but really honing in and listening to my body and then having a sounding board, you know, for a group of friends that I can talk to, you know, yeah. about things and when I have questions and when I need advice or when I just want to celebrate small wins, you know, that's, that's super important too. Uh, myth or not a myth. If I have a nice salad and I'm talking just lettuce and I've got some sort of uh, like lunch meat or grilled chicken, tomatoes, cucumbers, stuff like that. If I have that at five o'clock versus having that at 845, is that a difference on my body? Not really. Research has shown that the time of day that you eat is not as critical as the amount of food you consume over like a 24 hour period. So they've done research as far as like, you know, intermittent fasting or, you know, stop eating by a certain day. So I would say, listen to your body. If you're hungry at 845, have something healthy, just make sure like it's not going to affect your sleep. Cause sometimes people eat a lot of calories before they go to bed and then their body is working through all of that digestion and it affects their sleep. You mean so, kind of like that pizza? <laughs> <laughs> well, possibly, or, or I may have, um, snacked on a little bit of candy the other night before I went to bed and had a soda yeah. on and did not sleep well. And the next morning I was like, you know, I probably shouldn't have yeah. done that. <laughs> and I, yeah, cause, but we, we need that reward, right? We need whatever that little thing is and it can't be the whole pizza, but you know, uh, so I always make sure my wife has, uh, in our bottom left-hand drawer in the kitchen that she loves Dove's dark chocolate or dark chocolate with almond. And usually mm -hmm. after dinner, she'll have one. And yeah, that exactly. suits yeah, her, her mouth's good. Her body's good. She feels better. Like, okay, I needed that taste. And she just had one. So yeah. And enjoy it in a way that's mindful. So I kind of similar concept. I keep these Ghirardelli squares with the caramel in them. Yep. I have a pack of them in the pantry and you know, when I'm craving something sweet or just like a, you know, I'll grab one piece of chocolate and I don't shove it in my mouth yep. and just like shove it down. Like I'll go sit somewhere quiet and I'll unwrap it and I'll enjoy, like I'll savor it. Ah. I'll savor it. So enjoy it when you're doing it and, and get away from the mindless snacking. That's what really gets us in trouble. If you grab a pack of Oreos and go sit in front of the TV while you're watching your favorite show. And before you know it, you're halfway through the bag you know, that's what's going to cause the issues, not the single piece of chocolate that you're savoring and enjoying. Now, let's not badmouth double stuff Oreos in general. Let's just badmouth six at a time. Right? Yeah, I was actually at my um, B&I meeting last week. Yeah. I was talking about Girl Scout cookies. Oh, yeah. Um, because when I was in a cycle of New Year's resolutions, when I was trying to lose weight or get healthy or, you know, eat better, whatever the case may be, I was joking. And seriously, I would do really good up until Girl Scout cookies came out. And then, you know, I'd, I'd fall off the wagon. So friendly reminder that, you know, a serving of Girl Scout cookies is usually two or three cookies, <laughs> not the entire sleeve. Um, because we can get carried away with that. But yeah, if you're enjoying the foods you love mindfully, that's when you can create that balance and still enjoy those foods and reach your health and fitness goals. And I've uh, told my wife that if it's not in the house, I obviously won't eat it. But if the double stuff Oreos are in the refrigerator, it's how far I can spread my two fingers here. And that's how many I eat. And it's not good. There's a hundred things wrong with that, but that's when they taste the best. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> All right. So one of the other cool jobs you had prior to this, and you've just been doing uh, EverFit for about coming up on a year almost. Um, right. Well, I, so I was a school teacher last year. Right. So summer vacation hit. Um, I knew I was transitioning. 
And I knew it would be, you know, hard to start a new business. So I took my kids on an epic vacation um, over the summer to Europe. We spent two weeks there. And then when I got back, I got to work, you know, with the company. So um, six months cool. and just did kind of a hard launch in January. Okay. So, All right. Yeah. Um, what grade did you teach? Uh, most recently, second grade. I've got 10 years of experience teaching pre-K through second, mostly. I've done some um, kind of short and long-term sub positions up through fifth grade, but I really like the little ones. You know, yep. they're all cute and cuddly and they love you and look forward to seeing you. So, yeah. And, and here's a public service announcement to all the parents, because as I get older, I really don't care what comes out of my mouth because it's, it's right, usually. Uh, you'll, we all have that snot-nosed kid one day or one week out of the year that's on us. That's not on the teacher. So don't blame the teacher if your kid's being a pain in the butt always. <laughs> yes, yes. Because you got enough on your plate. Uh, and the the stuff they ask teachers to do, the paperwork, the testing to take the test. Oh, my gosh. I don't. I I imagine a lot of teachers lost the love, a, a, some of the love of teaching when all this corporate stuff came on you because you can't, it's hard to teach then knowing all the other stuff you have to do, right? Yeah, it's definitely challenging. I mean, that was one of the factors that went into my decision to leave education. Uh, during the pandemic, I was working 60 plus hours a week, uh, just, just trying to do my best for my students. Um, but unfortunately, that meant a lot of sacrifice for my own personal kids. I was missing out on a lot of stuff at home, and I carried a lot of mom guilt with me. Um, so that did, you know, contribute to my decision to transition out of the classroom, but I love the kids and, you know, I, there are parts of it that I miss definitely. So, yeah. So the more parents can, you know, partner with their teachers and support them, you know, the, the better we're going to be at retaining really good quality teachers. Agreed. Because it is stressful. There's a lot that yep. goes into a lot of politics oh, and, yeah. you know, everything. So. Yeah. And your kids are going to learn more if they're hearing a consistent message the parents sit down with them and do their homework. And our, our oldest son in high school, and this was many years ago, uh, he went through the International Baccalaureate program in high school. And about the third week in of his freshman year, I tapped out. I could not help him at all. <laughs> I got to know his teachers real well because I didn't know hardly any of the stuff he was learning. I hear you. I hear you. So when I taught kindergarten, um, that was shortly after they made the transition to Common Core. Yeah. And like I would send home answer keys with my kids so the parents could help their kids with kindergarten math. It yeah. was it was pretty funny. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's not taught the same way it was when we went through school. Yeah. And, you know, we went through school a while ago. So if you're not in a career field where you're still using that information, you know, it's, it's filed way back in there somewhere covered with dust and cobwebs. So yeah, I definitely. Hear, I hear you on that. And, uh, we, I always like to brag and, uh, I was at a BNI meeting this morning and was doing my elevator pitch and brought up my grandkids in that, uh, we now have a third grandchild, a second granddaughter. She is a week and four days old in Lakeland, Florida. So we have three, so it's the best club ever. But you have Congratulations. three. Thank That's you very awesome. much. I love it. I cannot hold them enough and kiss them enough. Oh, yep. Uh, so you have three teenage kids. I'm trying to remember back in the day. Now, boys or girls? So I have two girls, 18 and 16, uh, and my son is 13. So uh, my house is full of hormones and attitude. <laughs> did they dress him up when he was little? Um. Not, not so much. No, um, they were too busy doing their own things, but, um, he, he was definitely always a ladies man from the beginning. So yes. <laughs> and they would all, well, he's 13 now, so he's not full on dating or anything or probably got a friend, but I imagine if he was a little closer in age, his sisters would have to approve anybody he was going out with. Right. Um, yeah, he actually, he does have a little girlfriend. Right. She's super sweet. Yes. Like I said, he's a ladies man. I think right. he had his first girlfriend when he was four. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny. I think they're not super protective of him the same way that I think older brothers are protective of yeah. little sisters. Oh, yeah. 
Um, but it's fun. We've done some, you know, dates. Like I took them all to, they, they all have boyfriends or girlfriends right now, you know? So I took them all like to panic point for Halloween. Um, I was the seventh wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it's it's fun to see them and to you know we're we're having some really fun conversations, some really good conversations about life, about yeah. relationships, about uh, responsibilities, about all those things. And it's really just cool to develop that kind of relationship with them because it changes as they get older. Um, but also to see them, you know, start to navigate life and um, be there for them when they need some help, but also yeah. you know be able to step back and just cheer for them when you see them doing some really cool things. And that's exciting. Yeah. And having raised two boys, uh, I know what that's like. I know what smelly life that is like. Uh, and I'm very happy to have two granddaughters to watch them grow up and learn the female side of growing up that I was never, I had an older sister, but you know, we didn't spend a lot of time together because she didn't want me around her and I didn't want to hang out with her friends until I got older and I started noticing her friends. And then I wanted to hang out with my older sister. Yeah. Yeah. I have a brother that's 18 months younger than me. So yeah, I, I feel you. I yeah. feel you. Yeah. I would always say that um, girls tend to be more like emotionally exhausting and boys are more physically exhausting. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And I always feel for moms that have a son, but they didn't have a brother. So they don't understand why their five-year-old has a towel wrapped around his neck and he's standing on the back of the sofa trying to fly. And they've never seen that before. So they're like, what are you doing? Like trying to fly. There you go. <laughs> I just got well, done watching Superman. Superman. He's right? flying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. So I'm uh, very uh, curious to watch my two granddaughters grow up. And thankfully with video, you know, we get to talk to them uh, quite a bit and texting a lot with their parents and just learn how things are going. So I'm looking forward to that. But uh, yeah, it was, it'll be interesting. My wife will finally have somebody's hair to braid. Uh, the boys would never let her do that. So I think the granddaughters will happily let her do that. So. Nice. All right. So you have one of the, I think you may be the first person on the show that's done this. I've got to go back and look. I think this is episode number 188. And you were a bomb, you were an ordnance technician in the Air Force. So let me, let's start with why you decided to go into the Air Force in the first place. Uh, yeah, so I actually graduated high school at 16. I had a Wait, 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 stop, 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 stop. Bragging is not a good look on you, Samantha. It's <laughs> just not a good look. So how did you get through high school at the age of 16? Um, so, uh, spring break of my freshman year of high school, I moved from Maryland to South Carolina. Uh, and I guess just the way the school system was structured up in Maryland, I got a head start on credits. Um, so, when I moved to South Carolina, I was ahead of the game and I could graduate a year early. Now, let me brag I'm a Southerner. southerner. I've been a Southerner since first grade. Not surprised that you were ahead of the game when you moved to the South. Not knocking the South because I'm one of them, but not surprised. So, uh, so well, then you were 16, you graduated. That must have been weird. Yeah, because then I, I actually moved out at 16. I was working full time, going to college full time. Wow. As you can imagine, it wasn't really the college experience that anyone really looks forward to, right? No, because that's no. 16, you know, it's kind of awkward showing up at a college party yeah. or, you know, anything like that. So, um, so I did a year of that, but you know, I, so then by then I was 17 and I just didn't know what I wanted to do in life. So I felt like I was just kind of spinning my wheels, you know, burning myself out, working mm -hmm. full time, going to school full time, living on my own, supporting myself. Um, so I started thinking about, you know, what another option might be. Uh, and ultimately I decided on the air force, you know, I wanted to be a part of something that was bigger than myself and serve others. But I also wanted something that would give me guidance and direction and life skills. And I would have some, you know, good mentorship and education opportunities through that as well. So right. that's, that's kind of what led me towards the Air Force. Cool. Now, my wife is an Air Force brat. She graduated high school in Heidelberg, Germany. But with, and granted, this was back in the 70s. So it was a little easier to live in Europe back then. They lived in Turkey for a couple of years, loved it. 
Uh, but they also had to live stateside in like Lubbock. I'm not knocking any places like that, but you know, smaller towns where they are bases. So where were the, where's the best and, and worst place you got to live in your time in the Air Force? Mm, well, live. Um, or stationed. Right. Well, yes, stationed. So I was actually, well, what brought me to Raleigh eventually was that I was stationed at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. So that was my first duty station after training. Um, I did training at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. That was pretty cool. Yep. Um, our barracks was right next to the runway, so I could sit outside and watch jets taking off, which was fun. We had the beach there, not far from Panama City. So, you know, when you're in your late teens and you want to go down for spring break, that was always fun. Um, but as far as being stationed somewhere, I mean, I... I was stationed in Korea, which was cool, but I got to travel a lot, which was fun. So I did a week in Japan. I did a week in Egypt. I traveled all over the U.S. Ooh, nice. So, yeah. I, so yeah, because my dad way back in the day was stationed at Eglin when he got into the Air Force. And my brother-in-law was stationed at Hurlburt for a while. So that is uh, the panhandle of Florida, not the worst place to be stationed. Yes. No, not at all. <laughs> it's not near a golf course, better be near the beach, right? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> All right. So how do you get into the world of ordinance and bombs and, and diffusions and technicians and all that good stuff? Well, I wanted a job that wasn't boring. <laughs> so, you know, when you go into the military, you have to take the ASVAB, which is, you know, it assesses different skill sets to see what jobs you qualify for. Um I, I qualified for everything. So they, the recruiter handed me a book and he was like, what do you want to do? So I started flipping through the jobs, reading descriptions. I was like, I don't want to be in a kitchen. I don't want to be behind a desk. I don't want every day to look the same. So, you know, what looks interesting, what looks exciting. And I came across explosive ordnance disposal and just kind of stuck. Like that, that was it. And so. you would get called out where and when and why? Uh, yes. Yeah. So anytime, uh, well, we, so we supported not only the military police, but also local law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So anytime there was issues involving, you know, potential explosives or even like hazardous materials, we would get called out to support with that. So everything from, you know, something going wrong with an aircraft involving its explosives or um one one time there was a truck i think it was like a, a mining truck or something they were carrying explosives that they use commercially um had a, a vehicle accident and spilt explosive material all over the roads so we had to go out and help with that um you know a, a bomb dog sits on a vehicle, you know, alerts on a vehicle or alerts on something, we, we go out and support that. But the large majority of our, our job was done training. We were training other people. So we used to partner with like the Marines, for example, and train local law enforcement for, you know, when they're uh, going into a, a situation that, you know, is threatening to help with that. Um, we train military personnel too for how to respond if they see something suspicious and stuff like that, or we're training ourselves because, you know, that in that time, especially, you know, there was a lot going on as far as safety goes. Yep. So constantly training and, you know, being up to date on what's going on in the world and what the threats are and what potential threats are, you know, that was probably the biggest part of our job. When there was a situation you were called into, whether it was real time or a training session, were there different amounts of information you had going into it? And, you know, how much do you know sometimes and how much do you have to kind of figure out once you get there? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are times when you could be walking into a situation completely blind. All you know is that there's a potential threat here. And at that point, you have to assume everything's still on the table until you can start ruling out some things. And then, you know, there's other times where you walk into a situation where you have a lot of information, but you still want to proceed with caution because you don't know, you know, how valid that information really is. So you want to make sure that, you know, you take that information into the situation with you, but don't let it cloud your judgment. Okay, here comes a really stupid question, but it has a point to it. 
when you get when you got called out to a a live situation how do you as the technicians how can you actually protect yourself uh, you, you fall back on your training. Okay. You know, that's why we spend so much training because that way when you do get to a situation, you know, you feel confident that you can do your best work there. And then, you know, again, proceeding with caution, you, you never want to rush into something um, because that's when mistakes happen. When you're rushed, when you get complacent, that's when things go bad. So taking your time, really focusing on, you know, what, the situation is and how you can best approach it. And then, you know, thankfully, you know, the military, you're on a team. Mm -hmm. So it's never just you alone. Yep. So you're with some, you're with people who are less experienced than you and you're with people who are more experienced than you. And the good thing about like EOD, my organization is that, you know, everyone gets a say. It wasn't just, you know, the master sergeant who's barking orders. Like if I were, you know, a, an airman, a basic airman or whatever, I can ask questions and I can say, hey, did you notice this? And it's a really collaborative approach to it. Um, that way, you know, everybody has different experience and they're bringing that to the table. So you can really work together to problem solve. That's that's what it is. It's all problem solving, right? So. And with what you were wearing, that's not going to hold up if something goes really wrong. But what, I mean, how do you outfit yourself from a protection standpoint with helmets, all, all that stuff? Uh, yes. So um, first and foremost, you want to do anything remotely that you possibly can. So we had things, we had tools like the robot to help us with that. So initially, if we could, the first view of whatever the situation would be, would come from the robot. They would be sent in first. Um, you know, if you do have to approach something, we did have the bomb suit. I've got pictures of me in the bomb suit. <laughs> Um, so, you know, obviously that will protect you to a certain degree, depending on, you know, the size of the ordinance or the explosive item. Um, but yeah, so working remotely as much as possible is the biggest thing, uh, as little time as possible at the scene of what's going on and then situational awareness, just being aware of what's going on and, you know, really looking out for yourselves and you're always with somebody else. So again, you're not alone. So you got a team that's looking out for you too. Were you, I, I'm sure you had an incident or two. I'm not asking specifics or anything, but just, I, I don't want to minimize it by saying, had your undivided attention, but you had to have thought, I, you know, we don't know how this is going to go. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you get those moments. I mean, I don't, I don't know what I can say here, but like those, oh shit moments, mm -hmm. like this is really happening, right? Yeah. Like. Um, it happens and you just, you know, you got to stay cool, calm and collected. So you take a breath, you gather yourself and you go, okay, I'm prepared for this. And one step at a time, right? Were you, are you an adrenaline junkie in general? I mean, some people might say that. Um, you think? <laughs> <laughs> wow. And so, you know, I, I like to live life outside my comfort zone. That's okay. where growth happens, right? Yep. Oh, yeah. So yep. whether that be, you know, approaching a dangerous situation, uh, skydiving, running Spartan races, um, or just, you know, challenging myself with personal growth as far as, yep. you know, reading a book that makes me reconsider, you know, my mindset or something like that. So when, when yeah, you were, I mean, yeah, when you were growing up now, let me brag on my mother-in-law for a second up until She'll see, she'll be 87 on Saturday. So this would have been 20, 20 years ago. She would, she was able to still r ride a bicycle on the handlebars backward. Was that something that got your attention? Like going down a hill at 90 miles an hour with no brakes on your bike, just to see what would happen? Um, no, <laughs> I would like to say that um, I've learned to do Dangerous things carefully. <laughs> okay. Uh, do now. Uh, so, yep. But you know, I mean, I I own a motorcycle, and I can say that I, I got into that in the Air Force. Um, I probably, looking back, did some things that maybe I shouldn't have done. <laughs> um, but you know, I mean, I I think in general, I've always been pretty responsible. So even when I was looking to challenge myself, I would consider 
you know, what the risks are and how I can minimize that too. So it's kind of that balance between, you know, seeking that adrenaline rush, but doing it in a way that you're going to be able to walk away from. Does that mean if the roller coaster is not going backwards, upside down in the dark, you're not interested? I like roller coasters. I'm good with it. <laughs> yeah, but you want them right backwards in the dark, maybe flip over once or twice? Uh, you know, it depends. Like, you know, <laughs> roller some roller coasters are made for speed. Some yeah. of them are made for motion. Yeah. So, you know, I, I enjoy it all. All right. Um, when you were at when you were active duty did your how many times would your folks call you or family members call you and what did they really want to know as far as hey just checking in how you doing i mean what did they really want to know about your life back then um it just just to make sure i was okay yeah. more than anything um Another story. So I was actually supposed to be in New York on 9-11. We were supposed to be there supporting the Secret Service. And, um, you know, I told my family I was going. And then I didn't tell them that our flight got changed at the last minute. So we <laughs> ended up not being there. So my mom thought I was there. Um, and obviously, everything that was going on with the news, she, she freaked out. And um, I got a call from my boss. And she was like, you need to call your mom yeah. because she doesn't believe me that you're still alive. Yeah. <laughs> um, so mainly it was just to, to make sure I was okay more than anything. I remember because I went into the Air Force when I was 17, so I needed parents' permission to go. Um, but, you know, my mom was really concerned about my safety. You know, my dad was like, um, okay, you know, I'll support you. If this is what you want to do. But my mom was the one, of course, that was like, this is dangerous. Are you sure you want to do it? Um, so yeah, but, um, but they were supportive, which was good. And even my grandfather, my grandfather was a Marine in the Korean war. And I remember telling him that I was going into the air force and you know, the different <laughs> branches of the military <laughs> like to give each other a hard time. Oh, right? yeah. So I told him I was going into the air force and he goes, yeah, I like the air force. They have good food. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Now, I would imagine that your life insurance policy was raised a little bit once you decided on your uh, specific field. Ah, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> I was young and single and didn't have a lot of debt, so I didn't need yeah. a lot of life insurance, thankfully. But, um, but no, I mean, <laughs> they were supportive. And if you look back at the statistics then, you know, it really wasn't as dangerous as people make it I don't want to say it's not dangerous because yeah. it is a dangerous line of work, yeah. but there's so much training and preparation that goes into it that, um, you know, they've learned to do that work safely, as safely as possible. Now, yeah. obviously, once you head into a wartime situation, that, that changes the stakes a little bit. Um, but, you know, looking back, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have ch chose anything else. It was just such a great experience. And, you know, I learned so much and, grew so much during that time. And um, I'm just, I'm grateful for the opportunity I had when I was in the Air Force and everything that came with it. Now, not that your dad doesn't or wouldn't brag on your brother, but I bet when he got together with, with his buddies, like my daughter defuses bombs in the military. What does your daughter do? Oh yeah. I'd play that big time. <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, I would have played that card big time. Yeah, that would be good. So, uh, All right, so our tip of the week, now that we're kind of wrapping this up here, our tip of the week for folks, give me one or two things, simple things people could start doing today to begin the process of working out, getting healthier, however you want to phrase that. Yes, just, just pick one thing to focus on, something small. It, the problem is too many people try to do too much all at once and it's just not sustainable. So choose one healthy change that you can make that you feel confident making this week and start with that. And then once you get really good at doing that, add another thing. Once you get really good at doing that, add another thing. And it could be something as simple as, you know, trading out a soda a day for water. Um, you don't really think of it. That's about 150 calories you can save each day. And over the course of the year, that's 15 pounds of fat that you can lose not doing anything else but trading out one soda for a glass of water. Wow. So start with something small, okay. small habits, get good at them, and then build. Now, is all sweet tea bad or just some of it? 
<laughs> Can I quote you on this? <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing. Yes. Food is not good or bad. Food is inherently neutral. So it really just depends on how you use it. If all you're drinking uh, is sweet tea all day, yeah. then that's not a good habit. But if you enjoy a glass of sweet tea with, you know, for, it, for your afternoon drink or whatever the case may be, then it's in moderation, right? Okay. So food is inherently neutral. Same with drinks. It's just how you use it. Oh, so it's user error. Oh, we're blaming <laughs> the food this whole time, Samantha. I'm not happy with this. <laughs> this is not what I wanted to learn today. <laughs> but it does make sense. You're right. And I've cut my sweet tea down like twice a week. Okay, cool. Because and I could do, else could do. Yeah, it was make it half and half, half yeah. sweet, half unsweet. Yep. No, yeah. I'm with you on that. So, all right, folks, uh, uh, we've been putting uh, Samantha's phone number up here uh, with Everfit. She can just give her a call and chat with her for a few minutes on what would make sense for you and see if there's a, you know, a reason there to work with her. I think you'll find out that in the weight loss slash health slash nutrition world, an accountability buddy is huge, isn't it, Samantha? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And we need somebody just to call and go, I'm having a bad week. Help me kind of get re rerouted back to where I should be. And that's where you come in. Yeah. I mean, there's so much conflicting information out there that it can be confusing on knowing where to start and how to progress forward. And, and that's something that I can help with is a simple plan that's going to give you the results that you want. Wonderful. It has been a blast having you on the show. Love the stories about uh, um, you graduated high school at 16. That's just wrong. You're making the rest. Oh, my gosh. Uh, anyway, it is impressive. Let me tip my hat to you. That is very much impressive. Very impressive. So, uh, and then your time in the Air Force with what you did. I always, uh, you know, I'm glad people do that. So, because uh, I know it's not for everybody. Uh, but glad you do that. Glad you do that. Um, so our tip of the day is just pick one thing, right? Just change one thing. You see, I like the way you add, I like what you added to that and get good at it because we're like, oh, well, I've, okay. I just stopped for today. I'm not going to have any, I'm not going to have a diet Coke today. And then Wednesday comes around, you're back on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but pick one thing and get good at it. I like that. Thank you. Yes. It, it's really, it really is that simple. Yeah. Um, just get started. Yep. And that's, yeah. When's the best day to start? If it wasn't yesterday, it's today, right? Wonderful. Absolutely. Wonderful. All right, Samantha, it's been a blast. Love the stories. Good catching up with you again. Uh, and Thank you so, so much for having me. Uh, they can check you out on Facebook, right? Uh, where you put all your tips about cauliflower pizza is good for you and ice cream on waffles is good for you and things like that in moderation. That should, that's the name of your next book in moderation. <laughs> <laughs> All things in moderation. There you go. There you go. So anyways, but go check her stuff out, folks. Give her a call. Just pick her brain for a minute and see what the right road for you to get on to just feeling better. You don't have to be, you know, that like she was saying earlier, that Victoria's secret model or anything like that. Just, you got to feel better you. And that's pretty much half the battle, right? Absolutely. All right. Had a blast with you on the show today, Samantha. Good luck with everything. And we will see everybody next time on Triangle B and I. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.